Good morning. Welcome to Rock Hill. We are excited to worship Jesus this morning. We are going to begin by singing some songs. So if you're able, we would invite you to stand with us. Good morning. Welcome to Almost July. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're new to Rock Hill, I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, on the bottom of our bulletin, we have a welcome card. And if you're new, I invite you to fill that out and either drop it in the offering bowl when it comes by later or bring it to the back room uh, after the service. We'd love to give you a gift for visiting our church. And if you call this church your home on the back side of the welcome card, there's a spot for prayer requests. And our staff would be honored to pray for you for anything. So if you fill that out, we'll pray for you tomorrow in our staff meeting. This morning, Pastor Kyle is continuing our series on the life of David as we look at an encounter between David and his rival Saul. So to begin our time of worship, I'm going to read a passage of First Peter that meditates on how Jesus treated his enemies. He, that's Jesus, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin 
and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, thank you for dying and rising again to heal us by your wounds. Thank you for grace and grace alone that allows us to come before you, not as enemies, but as friends. It's all by your mercy that we worship you today. May you be glorified by our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
The one who made the heavens Made my heart and soul Before I drew a breath I was loved and known I am his creation The maker's masterpiece And all that he designs Will be done in me My body is the temple of the we sing those two songs back to back that you are the God who holds all things together you are the first you're the last you are sovereign over all and you are good and you are a kind and gracious father that allows us to freely and joyfully sing the words I am not my own and while that can seem scary God for those of us who know you it is such a freedom to say we are not our own and that is a good thing God, I pray that as we hear your scripture preach this morning, we would be encouraged where in the story we see David live that out in a, in a way. And God, may we ultimately be encouraged by Jesus, who when he was on earth, perfectly exemplified trusting the Father, perfectly living out, not my will, but your will be done. God, may we be people because we know you, that we can live that way, that we can trust you with our lives and rejoice in the fact that we are yours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. 
Good morning. My name is Kyle, one of the pastors. I have a question for you. Uh, how many of you either decided to follow Jesus in college or your college years were incredibly formative in your faith? That's a big number. That's a lot. See, it's such a strategic and important time. And I just wanted to introduce you to five people. Three of them are here today. Um, two of them will be also up on the screen. But we have a unique opportunity as a church that we have five students that are part of crew that are all doing an intern year this year uh, at UMD in the Twin Ports, uh, making known Jesus on UMD and UWS and St. Scholastica and the surrounding area. And so... Um, We've had a partnership with Crew for a lot of years, a lot of years, and we love the work they do on campus. We've never had five interns from our church at the same time uh, trying to raise support to do this, and yet I think it's such an incredibly exciting time and strategic time that I think God just is up to something. So I wanted to introduce Aaron and Grace and Jonah, and then also Luke you'll see on the picture up there, and Maddie are also part of Rock Hill. Luke runs the soundboard a lot, but it's summer, and so it just, it's hard to get everybody here. I wanted to let you know that they're here in case you get a call from them. They all have to raise funds uh, in order to do that and give a, a year of their life uh, to the work of the gospel on these campuses. So I just wanted to let them introduce themselves to you and kind of maybe even why, why they're doing it. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Aaron Bloomberg. Uh, I just graduated from UMD here. Um, I've been involved with the crew ministry for four years. Um, I, last service, I kind of joked, when I first got involved, there was like five or six of us, and now we've got five interns, so that's pretty cool. Um, but a cool thing from last year, we had 36 students put their faith in Jesus for the first time. So that's definitely awesome. something to celebrate. And I'm... <laughs> But I'm just so excited to come back onto the campus. I'm um, just serve those students, um, help disciple students, and with hopes to just bring even more students to Jesus. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Grace. I also graduated. And yeah, I'm just really encouraged to be able to walk along with four of my friends to be able to lead ministry on campus. Um, yeah, I was a part of Crew for three years, and it just transformed my relationship with Christ so much. So, yeah, I'm just really encouraged to be able to um, walk other students along that journey this next year um, and just lead them to Christ. Um, my name is Jonah. Um, yeah, Crew's been pretty awesome for me. Just um, so many transforming relationships, and um, one of them's Aaron, was my roommate this last couple of years. But um, yeah, there, there's so many kind of barriers I built up in my faith over the years, and Crew's kind of been there to kind of bridge all of those, bridge over all of those, and um, I really would just want to be able to be there for students who are struggling like I was and um, need help, um, be there to help them. Yeah, that's why I won't, I've, I've never been called to anything in my life, and I feel pretty called to this, so that's why I want to be faithful to the Lord. <laughs> awesome. So here are three of them. The other two are on the screen. If you get a call from them, I'd encourage you to at least sit down and listen to what God has been stirring in your heart and then pray about partnering with them financially uh, for this strategic time. Now, before I dismiss you, if you were to look up here and look at how we're dressed, which person do you think would be preaching today? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to put that on you. But I thought it might confuse some of you guys, so I just want to clarify that. So we're going to take just a moment now to greet one another, get, get some coffee in the back, and uh, when the timer comes down, uh, we'll gather back. We'll be in 1 Samuel 24.
All right, if you could find your way back to your seats, that'd be great. We are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We on? Okay. It's always the second service, you guys. First service, 9 o'clock has no problem coming back. It's you. I guess you guys like each other more. Well, here, here's the thing. Um, we got a baptism today. That's pretty cool. Matthew Wright, yeah. He's going to make a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus publicly, and so that is exciting. Uh, this weekend has been filled with just kind of the full gamut of emotions for me. I had my oldest daughter. We had her grad party yesterday, and so that was a fun celebration that we had to have. Uh, Natalie, who often comes and signs, she got married yesterday. And so as a church, we're just celebrating with her and Alex. Um, and then on Friday, I went to a funeral of a friend of mine who was 33, a pastor in, uh, in Barris, Minnesota, has five children, and he lost his battle to cancer. A full spectrum of emotion, right? And here's the thing, like, someone is always going through something. And, and a lot of times as a family, it happens at the same time. And... One of the things that should happen when we open up God's word is that it should speak to us. It should speak to the, the nitty gritty realities of everyday life. It should speak to the high highs and the low lows and the 80% of the middle that just ends up being a grind. Where it's not great, it's not bad, it's just the grind. When we open up God's word, the spirit speaks to us. Sometimes really specifically and acutely because we needed to hear exactly that. Sometimes we're simply building a grid to understand the ups and the downs and the all-arounds of life. We open up God's Word. We become familiar with the story of the Scripture because it gives us categories for who God is and how He relates to His people in the good and the bad and everything in between. And so that's why we open up the Bible every single week. That's why the primary point of the sermon is usually the point of the text. Not because that's exactly what you needed to hear every given Sunday. It's not. But because God wants you to know who he is. And how he has enacted a plan of salvation. And how he has related to people throughout the course of human history. So that we, when we have those moments, whether that we maybe don't understand, we know God who is with us in the good and the bad and the average. And we know that he is trustworthy. The question that I want you to wrestle with today is that when life feels out of control, when things don't go the way that you had planned them to go, are you going to grasp control? Or are you going to entrust yourself to the Lord? Are you going to try to seize the wheel? Or are you going to entrust yourself to a providential God who knows the end from the beginning? Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to open up your word. Would you help us to not just see David and Saul and the story being played out for us, but also to see ourselves and how you interact with us. Holy Spirit, would you speak through me or would you speak in spite of me? But would you speak to every single person listening right now? I pray in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Have you ever heard, or maybe someone has told you, or maybe you've said to someone else, God's timing is perfect? How'd it go when you receive those words? Sometimes it is exactly what you need to hear, and you are reminded of the providence of God who orders things and, and puts things together perfectly, and you see how everything works out. But sometimes when you hear that, it feels patronizing. Or it feels like it trivializes what you're feeling in that particular moment. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, it's, it's usually coming from a good place. It's usually coming from someone who knows us and loves us and wants to just reorient our perspective to God and how he sees and interacts with things. Or maybe they're sharing a, a story from their own life of a, of a time where they were confused and it didn't make sense. And, and then they saw later on how God was at work the entire time. 
And usually we hear the story when everything's got a nice bow on it and it's all put together and we think, I don't know how God is going to do that here. Here's the thing. That phrase is true. But it's often hard to hear when we most need to hear it, isn't it? God's timing is perfect. We've been journeying through the life of David in our summer sermon series. And my guess is by the time we get to his story in 1 Samuel 24, he's probably wondering, when is it going to be my time? When am I actually going to be king like God promised? When is there going to be a day when God fulfills his promise and I don't have to run from my life anymore? See, it's been about 15 years since the prophet Samuel anointed him as the new king. But Saul is still very much alive. And he's not only alive, but he is now continually seeking David because he sees him as a threat to his own rule and his own kingdom. Even though he is now the king's son-in-law and his son Jonathan is his best friend and he's made no attempt to seize the throne but been a loyal subject at every turn, Saul sees him as a threat and wants to kill him. See, for Saul, to kill David is to solidify his grip on the kingdom that God has promised that he's tearing away from him. That's the context of our story in 1 Samuel chapter 24. You can turn there now or tap there or it'll be on the screen. Saul has tried to kill David a number of times already, with David narrowly escaping because of either his own reflexes, dodging the spear, or the help of Jonathan, or the help of his wife Michael, or Abimelech the priest, or a whole host of others that see clearly that God's anointing and blessing is now on David and not on Saul, helping David out along the way. And at the end of chapter 23, Saul is pursuing David with his army, and he's about to overtake him. He has a way stronger force, when all of a sudden he gets a message that the Philistines are attacking and raiding the cities, and so he has to he has to abandon the pursuit of David, go and take care of some business, and actually running and ruling the kingdom, and, and taking care of the enemies of God and, his peop, uh, and, and their, uh, the Philistines. And now in chapter 24, he comes back and, and starts the pursuit again. The key question that David has to face, and I think we will face as well, is when God's timing is confusing, are we going to grasp for control, or are we going to trust? Are we going to take matters into our own hands, or are we going to continue to entrust ourselves to God? So grasp or trust. Let's read. 1 Samuel chapter 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? 
After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared that this day how you have dealt with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. There's a whole chapter of Scripture, but really one story. It kind of breaks down into three parts. The first, verses 1 to 7, is the actual events or action of the story. Verses 8 to 15 are David's words to Saul after he spared him. And verses 16 to the end are Saul's words of repentance and uh, confession after he sees that David intended him no harm. I'd, look at, I'd like to look at the story from three different points of view. From Saul's perspective from David's perspective, and then real briefly from David's men's perspective. So from Saul's perspective, he's been pursuing David for a while now. In chapter 23, he overtook David and he was about to capture him and gets a message that he has to go back home and take care of the Philistine enemies. And so he does. And then he comes back. And so I want to be clear that this is not simply a crime of passion or a temporary lapse of temper that has Saul pursuing David. No, he means to harm David. He sees him as a threat, an an arrival to take the throne. Now, if you remember back in chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15, God told Saul that he was tearing away the kingdom from him, and he's going to give it to another. Now, Saul, rather than embracing this reality and stepping away quietly, he fights tooth and nail trying to preserve his power and trying to hang on to this kingdom that God is giving to another. And then there's David, the clear heir apparent. As I was thinking about the situation that unfolded between David and Saul, it reminded me of the TV show The Weakest Link. You're like, how in the world did that happen? Well, are are you familiar with the show? Uh, Basically, the premise of the show is that a group of contestants start, and they have to work together, and then they vote each other off, okay? So the, the, the panelists will go around, and they'll ask each of these people a question, And you want to have smart people on your team because with every question that they answer right, the amount of total money that you win goes up. And that at certain times throughout the round, someone needs to yell bank in order to bank the money because if you don't, the first question that you get wrong, all of that money goes away. And so there's a whole bunch of strategy about getting questions right and letting that grow and then banking the money and going on and on. Now at the end of every round, the the contestants have to vote off the weakest link. The person who maybe didn't answer any any questions correctly or didn't bank any money because the total amount that you win depends on how good your team is. And so usually the people who don't get anything right, they get voted off and they're like, you're the weakest link, goodbye. But then, later on in the game, a little bit of strategy starts to take place. See, if you are the strongest player and you get all of the answers right, eventually the people are going to turn on you. Not because you're not a good player, but because they know they can't beat you. And all of a sudden they're thinking, wait, if it gets down to me and you, there's no way I'm going to answer more questions right than you. And so as it gets down, people start to turn and say, no, that person's the weakest link. And they get voted off. And so the goal is to kind of like be the best, but not really kind of be in the weeds a little bit so that you're not the target for everybody else. Now, how in the world is that like Saul and David? Well, every one of David's victories contributed to Saul's blessing, didn't it? When he killed Goliath, when he became the captain of Saul's armies, and he went out and he beat the Philistines over and over again, when he wrote music and played it before the king and soothed his mind, all of the things that David was doing was was a blessing to Saul, was 
helping Saul until the moment Saul began to get jealous of David and to realize the blessing of God is on you more than it's on me. And Saul was no dummy. He could read the, the signs of the situation. He realized probably pretty quick that this is my rival. And so even though David had been nothing but loyal, even though his best friend was the king's son, even though he was now the son-in-law of Saul, rather than embracing this reality, Saul tried to seize power. He tried to grasp for a kingdom that was being taken away from him, and David then became the threat that he had to eliminate, even though he was nothing but loyal. Do you see that? What a stark contrast in how these two men responded to that question. When life doesn't make sense, will you grasp for power? Will you try to seize control? Or will you entrust yourself to the Lord? Saul is kind of the anti-hero, and David here becomes the hero. Do you see the contrast? Now, from David's point of view, imagine this from his perspective. As a teenager, you were chosen by God. You were anointed by Samuel, the prophet. You were the least likely and youngest of your brothers to be chosen, yet God saw something in you where he said, that's going to be the next king. That is the one and the, the man that I choose. You didn't ask for this. In fact, you only wanted to be faithful to your God, and yet God chose you and is now blessing you and empowering you to do things that you couldn't do before. God used you to kill Goliath, to write and play music that blessed the king and the kingdom, to lead the armies of Israel in routs of their enemies. You become best friends with Jonathan, the crown prince, and even a son-in-law of Saul himself. But now, whereas you've been nothing but a blessing and loyal to this king, he sees you as an enemy and a threat. And after running for your life time and time again, you have these narrow escapes. Chapter 23, chapter 20, chapter 22. I mean, it's over and over again. Saul tries to take out David. And now you see this moment. Saul is ready to overwhelm you, kill you and all of your men. And he's right there. He's using the cave that you're hiding in as a bathroom, and so he is unbelievably vulnerable. And so you go up, and you cut off a corner of his robe. And as you do this, you are convicted and cut to the heart yourself. See, the robe of a king was symbolic. Showed your status, your power. In chapter 15... After hearing God's rejection of him, Saul clings to the robe of Samuel, perhaps to curry favor, perhaps to get him to reverse the decision, but to, to keep the kingdom himself. And as Samuel pulls away from Saul in that moment, the robe of Samuel tears, and this is what he says. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. As David cuts the corner off of Saul's robe, there is incredibly symbolic things going on here. Because of the fulfillment, this is the fulfillment of the promise that God has made. David is the one who is better than Saul. David is the one that God has chosen. But as he does this, he's convicted. Verse 5, not like this. I'm not going to do it like this. I'm not going to stretch out my hand and murder the king when he's not looking. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands and grasp power like this. I'm going to entrust myself to God, and I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed king. And not only does he not take a, a sword or a, a spear and take out Saul, but he prevents his men from doing so as well. Which is one thing if you're David, but imagine being one of his soldiers, one of his men. They had thrown their lot in with David because they saw the hand of God was blessing him. That made them traitors to the throne, didn't it? I don't think Saul would have thought twice about butchering them in that cave if he knew that they were in there. One slash of the thor sword, one thrust of the spear, and they wouldn't have to run anymore. It'd be over. Their guy would be the king, and they would probably be rewarded in kind. But here's this moment that you're thinking, no way. This is victory snatched from the, the jaws of certain defeat. And David says, no, that's not how we're going to play this. 
It's not how we're going to do this. I'm not going to reach my hand out against the Lord's king and his anointed. That's not how this is going to go down. We can imagine their disappointment. The narrative doesn't tell us anything about their perspective, but you can imagine their fear and their sense of maybe questioning this guy's leadership ability. See, at this point, David lets Saul go. He does his business, and he's off, and he's completely oblivious that any of this stuff is going on. And David has a decision to make, doesn't he? Does he just let Saul leave? Or does he put himself and all of his men at risk in order to try to set the record straight? Remember, Saul has the superior army. The numbers don't make sense for David to, to create a stand here. There's a reason David and his men are fleeing. But David decides, hey, this is going to end today. We're not going to keep doing this. Not by killing Saul and taking matters into his own hands, but by putting himself in Saul's hands. And more than that, entrusting himself to the Lord's hands. David knew that he was the Lord's anointed, that God had promised him the kingdom. But that doesn't mean that there's no emotional struggle going on as he wrestles with, should I do this or not? I mean, if you want to know that King David had some emotional struggles, just read the book of Psalms. It's filled with all kinds of prayers and songs and pouring out his heart and his struggle to the Lord and finding rest in a God who works all things out according to his own timing. And so he calls out in verse 8, my king, my lord, the king. And he bows down and he begins to reason with Saul. He says, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks you harm. I could have taken you out today. I spared your life. The only reason that you aren't dead right now is because I want you to know that I'm not your enemy. I don't seek your harm. Look at the corner of your robe. Notice it's missing something. I cut that off while you were doing your business. My men wanted to kill you. And you were in my hands. But I'm not going to take matters into my own hands like that. I'm not going to oppose the Lord's anointed king. Whether David is just trying to lay, a, lay down precedent of don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. I mean, you could see that that would, might be a self-serving motive later on in his life. Or simply, he was entrusting himself to God to work this out, the thing that he had promised him. But David puts himself into Saul's hands and the Lord's hand, and he says in verse 12, may the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. I'm not going to be your enemy, Saul. I'm going to entrust this situation to the Lord, and he knows. As the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness. So wicked people do wicked things, right? Righteous people do righteous things. But my hand shall not be against you. Let God judge between us. He knows my heart. And I have shown you in a demonstrable way that I am not wicked and I'm not seeking to harm you. See, rather than grasp for power, David entrusts himself to the Lord. It's beautiful, isn't it? Saul hears this and has a moment of clarity. Now I say a moment because later on in the next few chapters, he's going to come back to hunting David again. But we see a moment of beautiful clarity where Saul sees reality rightly and he's cut to the heart. Verses 17 to 21 are beautiful. He said to David, you are more righteous than I. The exact phrase that Judah said to Tamar back in Genesis 37. You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. He's saying, David, you're right. I see it now. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? That doesn't make sense. So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. David, I've sinned. You're more righteous than I am. I see that I was in your hands and you let me go. May God reward you for the kindness and mercy you've shown me. And then Saul sees what's going on and he states it. Verse 20. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore to this, swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. David, I know you're going to be king. I see the handwriting on the wall now. 
So I want you to do me a favor. Don't kill my kids. Don't kill my offspring. Now, why would he have to say that? Well, in ancient times, if you were to go and establish your throne, taking it away from another king, you would often eliminate all of the other threats or those who would have any claim to the kingship as well. It was standard operating procedure in their day. You take out not just the king, but all of his living relatives as well. But what do we know about David and Jonathan? They're best friends. What we know about David and his heart towards Saul, he's not against him. And so David says, sure. And we already know that David's already promised this to Jonathan two chapters ago. They already made a covenant. Hey, we're on the same team here. I know that God is going to raise you up, but I'm okay with that. But notice how Saul, even though he sees that, he doesn't actually act in accordance with that, does he? As he goes to the next few chapters, all of a sudden, after this moment of clarity, he is David's enemy again. And he tries to take out David again. And in chapter 26, almost the exact thing happens. David has an opportunity to kill Saul, and he doesn't. And then he does this all again. And yet in this moment, he sees clearly. And David says, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And they depart in peace. Now notice they don't depart as buddies again. How do we know that? Well, if they did, they would all just gone back home like everything was fine, but they don't. Saul goes back home, but where does David go? He goes back to a stronghold. He's like, yeah, we're good. I'm not, I'm not sure I fully trust you though. And for good reason. So here's the thing. What do we learn from this? I mean, this, this happened 3,000 years ago. I don't think anybody in this room has been anointed king over anything, unless you have, then you can come tell me. That'd be kind of interesting. My guess is no one in this room has someone who's trying to kill them. Although, if so, yeah, let me know. So how does this story in, in any way relate to our life? Uh, here's the thing. I bet every single person in this room has been tempted to grasp for control when life circumstances feel out of whack. To seize the steering wheel rather than entrust yourself to the Lord who knows and guides you. There are times in your life and my life where it just doesn't make sense. And therein becomes the crucible, doesn't it? It's not when things are going well that we struggle to trust God. It's when things don't seem to line up with what our expectations were or what we thought God might have promised us. When our expectations for life and for happiness are not met. It's when we thought things would go this way, but they went another way. That becomes the place, the testing ground for whether or not we are going to entrust ourselves to God or whether we're going to try to seize control ourselves. Saul, when presented with the opportunity, tried to seize control and eliminate the threat. David, when presented with the opportunity, entrusted himself to God perfectly. See, life doesn't often go exactly the way we thought it would. I do a lot of weddings. And when I do weddings and couples say their vows one to another, they're not thinking about one of them getting cancer someday. They're not thinking about one, one of them struggling with a mental illness or someone losing a job or a rebellious child or a child who dies in an accident. I'm not thinking about any of that. And yet they say their vows on this day that they feel the most amount of love for each other and those vows hold them on the days that they don't. They entrust themselves to one another <laughs> for better or for worse. And then that gets tested over a lot of years, doesn't it? And sometimes the expectations are met, and sometimes they're not. Here's the thing. When we enter relationship with God, we often think that our life is going to go a certain way. And we don't expect that those things are going to come, but they do. And when they come and life doesn't match up with what we thought it would be like, we are presented with a choice. Do I grab the wheel? Do I seize control? Or do I entrust myself to God? In this moment, David had a choice. Is he going to take matters of the kingdom into his own hands? As the Lord's anointed king, is he going to strike down 
the one who stood in his way. And probably no one would have blamed him if he did. Or is, it, is the kingdom of God going to be done a different way? Not by seizing, but by letting God do his thing. David's actions show that the rule and the reign of God is different. It isn't seized by violence or exploited by demonstrations of power. And in doing this, David does imperfectly what Jesus would later do perfectly. In Philippians chapter 5, we have one of the earliest hymns of the Christian church reflecting on Jesus and his saving work. And it says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, used, exploited for his own benefit, leveraged, seized, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus didn't exploit the fact that he was God's anointed and that he was actually God himself in the flesh. He didn't grasp onto his deity and leverage it for his own gain. But he emptied himself of his rights, privileges, took the form of a servant. Not just by letting the enemy go free, but by letting the enemy turn on him and kill him. He died on the cross and won our salvation. David served Saul by showing him compassion and letting him live Jesus condescended from an even loftier position and served us in an even greater way. So what does God do with people like that? We read verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just as God eventually exalted David and made him king, and then made a crazy covenant with him in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, that not only would he not take the throne away from David, he wouldn't take the throne away from any of David's descendants, but, but that David's descendants would always sit on the throne of God's people. And David was unbelievably imperfect. We'll see that in the coming weeks. But God made a covenant with him. He exalted him and raised him up. And then he fulfilled that covenant to David by raising up David's greater son, whose name is Jesus, who would rule and reign on that throne, not by seizing power himself, but by laying down his life, only to take it up again and let God exalt him. And because of that, we have hope. Because here's the thing, you are not going to do this perfectly. And neither am I. Go and be like David. David. And trust yourself to God. You're not going to bat a thousand. I promise you. There are moments where, where you have a crisis of faith and you make the wrong decision. You seize control. You say, no, God, I got this. How's that go? Not very well. I can promise you. But Jesus did it perfectly so that you don't have to. And the good news is that through faith in him, he did it for you. So having done this for us, here David, and then later Jesus, also show us an example of how to truly live. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude or approach of Jesus when dealing with one another. See, the context of this is actually an issue of church unity. That the people of the Philippian church were, were seeking their own interests above other people in the church's interests, and they were putting themselves forward. And Paul says, no, 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 that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. No, like Jesus, who didn't push his own agenda, he didn't grasp or seize power, but he emptied himself and made himself nothing and served. We should have the same attitude. Now, I'm glad that none of those things affect the church today. Uh, we, we never put ourselves forward. We never have conflict or disunity, right? No, I kid. But the reality is, we have a model in which to follow, and it's our Savior. And, and it's not that we save ourselves by, by following his example perfectly. No, there's a reason Jesus had to come and die and rise again. It's because we didn't. But upon believing that, we see in him a glorious example of how to truly live and entrust ourselves with God. And so really, the question that I want you to go home with today and think of whenever you're wrestling and life doesn't seem to make sense is, am I going to grasp or am I going to trust 
Am I going to seize the wheel? Or am I going to entrust myself to him who judges justly? How might that attitude change your life, your work, your marriage, your parenting, your sports team, your reputation? My point here is not that we shouldn't try hard or think creatively about how God might deliver. I know on the other side of this is that uh, you maybe have heard the parable of the person who's like on a rooftop and, and the, ho- the whole area is flooding and you pray to God for deliverance and there's someone who comes by in a boat and they're like, hop in and you're like, no, God's going to deliver me. And then as, you, as, the, as the floodwaters rise, a, a helicopter comes and they're like, get in. And they're like, no, God's going to deliver me. And eventually the person uh, like is overwhelmed by the flood. And God's like, I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. The tricky thing about this story is that like some of us would be like he sent you Saul I mean you could have gotten a few more years and yet it was different because it was raising your hand against the Lord and against his anointed David was clearly convicted and cut to the heart so that he would entrust himself to God it's not that we just kind of let go and let God and, and we think that God has to miraculously provide and deliver us from every circumstance but rather that we as a whole entrust ourselves to God knowing that he's trustworthy and that God's timing is perfect. Even and especially when it doesn't make sense. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of David, which provokes us and challenges us and encourages us. God, we confess that we don't do this perfectly. Our faith is not perfect. We don't always entrust. Sometimes we we seek to seize control. We, We seek to grab power. But God, we say today, we declare today in our prayer, you are trustworthy and we trust you. And so God, help us to trust you and find in that that it is the path to true freedom. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to continue worshiping our Lord by singing your heart out to him. After this song, we'll have a baptism, and then we'll all celebrate with another song. Also during this song, uh, the ushers will be receiving our offering. We just invite you to give as God leads you to give. Or if you're new here with us, if you would just drop that Connect card in the offering plate as it goes by, that would be a great gift to us. We would love to be able to follow up, follow up with you. Would you guys stand as we sing?
Amen. You guys can have a seat. Matthew, you want to come on up? All right. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Any experiential learners among us? Like you can hear something or maybe you can see something, but like when you experience it, you're like, got it. All of us to a certain extent, like that makes it real. Uh, one of the great gifts of the sacraments or the ordinances of the church, communion and baptism, is they give us a tangible physical experience to help us understand what God is doing when he saves us. Uh, just like we need to eat food and drink drink and take it in and we are nourished uh, by the food and by the drink. So the act of remembering who Jesus is and what he has done for us has a way of nourishing and encouraging our faith week in and week out. That's why we do baptism over and over again, but we don't actually ever invite you to rededicate your life to Jesus. That's what communion is. <laughs> so you're saying, I still need him, still trusting in him, right? And it's not wrong to rededicate your life to Jesus. That can be incredibly meaningful, but that's what we're supposed to do week in and week out. Baptism it's something we do once. And it reminds us of what God does when he saves us. We are united to Jesus by faith so that his life and his death, in many ways, we are united to, like, becomes our death and our new life. We're united with Jesus as he dies and he's buried. And then as he rises to newness of life, so the life that we now live in him is a new kind of life, a resurrected life, a life that's best described as like a new birth. We're being born from above, right? Just as our need for our sin to be washed away as we see in the baptism waters that there's a sense of cleansing. All of these beautiful metaphors to help us understand what is Jesus doing when he saves us. Now here's a crazy thing. Baptism doesn't save you. It's just a thing. Our faith in Jesus saves us, but baptism makes that faith public. It proclaims to a watching world, I'm with him. So Matthew is going to do that today. You've, you've seen a few of these here, haven't you? Yes, I have. But today is the day. I'm so excited. I got four questions for you. Matthew, do you confess that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? I do. And do you confess that Jesus is that Savior, and are you trusting in Him alone for salvation? Yes, I do. Are, are you also confessing that He is your Lord, and that you're going to walk with Him in obedience with Him as the Lord of your life? Absolutely. Can you share with us your story and why you want to be baptized today? Yes. Awesome. All right, my name is Matthew Wright, and I've been blessed to call Rock Hill my home for the past 13 years. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I was raised in a very loving Christian home with my parents who were incredible examples to my siblings and I. I went to a small Christian school and was also blessed to be able to have an educational environment that helped me grow in my faith as well. However, my journey was not always easy. Like most teenagers or high schoolers, I had my share of doubts. I didn't see my faith as anything special and I did not feel truly invested in it. I didn't prioritize my relationship with Jesus, and I strived more for things of this world. And throughout my later years of high school and beginning of college, I would choose to indulge more and more into typical things of this broken world, while also in many instances being someone who I wasn't and didn't want to be. I came to realize none of this truly fulfilled me at all. I've had such amazing examples through friends, family, and even speakers I've seen on social media have an incredible impact on my life but I know that it is God working through each and every one of them to help bring me back to him and to also help me grow and strengthen my relationship with him every single day. I know that without Christ, I am nothing, and I've never been more ready to be baptized and publicly proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit, united with Jesus in the likeness of his death. <laughs> Will you stand with us? Just as Matthew declared his dependence on Christ alone, let's do that together as a church family.
Father, would you teach us to abide? Jesus, so that every day we would find our hope and our strength in you. Jesus, that we would learn to rest in you. God, as those who are weary and are heavy laden, Jesus, we find rest in you. And we pray that each and every day we would learn more and more to trust in you in all circumstances, in the good and the bad and everything in between. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. My name's Kelsey. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and just got a couple announcements for you. Uh, first off, if any of you are interested in being baptized, uh, you can get in contact with any of the pastors or uh, email info at rockhillcc.org, and we would love to get that arranged and get you baptized. Uh, next announcement is foundations class. So our foundations class, we've got a change of location. Uh, so if you're planning on being there, it's actually going to be downstairs uh, at 1215 today. Uh, that's our membership class. So if you've been at Rock Hill, been around Rock Hill for a little while and are looking to uh, really dive in and be a part of what we do here, the foundations class and membership is the next step for that. So uh, downstairs, 1215 today. Uh, the next announcement, uh, summer in Duluth is really the best time to be in Duluth. I don't think we can, uh, I don't think there's too much disagreement about that. Um, and so we're going to be having a church in the park. So Lincoln Park, uh, right down there, uh, not this building, down at the actual park. On July 14th, we'll be meeting at 10 a.m. for one service uh, to sing praises, to be outside, uh, and to really have a cool opportunity to worship together outside. Um, so that will be two weeks from now, uh, 10 a.m. Rain plans are, if it does rain, we'll make the call on the weather, and it would just be regular services here as usual. So again, trying to squeeze every last bit of summer out of Duluth. Uh, the next announcement is beach day. So on July 21st, we will be meeting down at Park Point at the recreation area uh, from 3 to 7 p.m., a chance for everybody from all campuses to come hang out, uh, do beach things. I don't know what beach things are, but um, we'll figure it out. It'll be a good time. We'll be outside, and it'll be sunny. I'm making that prediction. Um, finally, uh, our last announcement is a little bit different than the other ones. We've hired a new kids director. Uh, so we've hired Jelaine Zandorowski, who uh, wants to uh, be a part of the kids ministry here to help disciple our kids. And so just wanted to give her a chance to come up and say hi and introduce herself. Um, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about kids ministry. Thanks. <laughs> Hi everyone, happy Sunday. It's a beautiful day today. Um, as Kelsey said, my name is Jolaine. You can call me Joe. I am the new kids director here and I'm super excited about this role. I can't wait to teach and share more about Jesus to all the kiddos downstairs. It's so important and they are in the next generation of future disciples. So it's our job to encourage them in their walk to faith. So that brings me to, if you have been thinking about serving at Rock Hill or volunteering with kids ministry, we really need volunteers downstairs. We have a lot of kids, and they need to hear about Jesus. And so if you're interested in doing that, please reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you and connect with you about that. And yeah, thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Very excited to have her on the team. And so now, Rock Hill, would you stand with me? This morning, you are not dismissed, but you are sent to declare, display, and delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have a great week.